Welcome to Rising Woman Leaders. I'm your host, Meredith Rahm, and I believe the time has come for women to share their gifts, their voice, and their stories. I love seeing women spiritually and financially empowered, thriving in their life's work, and doing what they love every day. I've gathered a community of women living their dreams to tell us their stories and inspire us to step into more courage, self-love, and feminine leadership. If you like this podcast, use the hashtag Rising Woman Leaders. Follow me on Instagram at Meredith Rom and sign up for email updates at risingwomanleaders.com to get all the new and inspiring content. Now get cozy with a journal and a cup of tea. I hope you enjoy today's show. I'm here today with Elena Brower, who is a renowned author, yoga teacher, and speaker. Influenced by several yoga traditions, including para yoga and katona yoga, she is recognized internationally for her expertise in combining physical alignment and the art of attention. Since 1998, Elena has been offering these practices as a vehicle for approaching our world with realistic reverence and gratitude. She is the author of Art of Attention, a yoga workbook that has been translated into six languages, and the creator of Teach.Yoga, a virtual home for yoga teachers worldwide. Her new book, Practice You, will be out in September 2017 from Sounds True. Thanks for being here, Elena. You are most welcome. (laughs) Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I have no. I've been a student of yours in when I visited New York a couple mm-hmm. times, and have practiced your classes online as well. I'm sure people listening may be familiar with your yoga classes, mm-hmm. and I know that you've been a practitioner yourself for a very long time. And I wonder if you could just speak to a little bit about first discovering yoga, what that brought to your life. I took a class in 1992 or three fell in love with it mainly because I had been so accustomed to taking ballet classes, which were, you know, very negatively oriented. There wasn't positive feedback. It was always what I was doing wrong rather than what I was doing right. I got to yoga and suddenly it was all about what I was doing right. Mm -hmm. And with subtle adjustments and enhancements to even do it more correctly. Mm -hmm. It was so pleasant and so uplifting and true. And so I began practicing, you know, probably weekly or twice weekly. And I was invited to take a teacher training about six years later by Cindy Lee, whom I had met uh, at one of her classes at Crunch Fitness randomly. <clears throat> she was actually teaching there on a day that she wasn't meant to be, I believe. And she said, oh, I, you know, I said, I loved your class. I loved how you used everybody's name. I loved how familiar you were with, with everybody. And um, I'm inspired. She said, oh, well, you should take my, my teacher training. So cool. Uh, tell me more. And she, I think she handed me a sheet of paper with the application. This was like in 1998. So we, we really didn't have smartphones. We had, you know, Motorola flip phones. There was no transmitting of Uh, email as much as it is now. She handed me the piece of paper, I took it home, and I started to read it, and I began to create art for all the answers, little pieces of art. I sewed them, I drew them, I painted them, I was so much fun, and took her training and found a facility for it. I had just finished getting trained to teach art to children for a year, and so that sort of prepped me for teaching yoga to my peers, which I really, truly enjoyed made me nervous as all get out, but I, I enjoyed it. And at the time, there were so few yoga studios, and my class got big quickly, I think more because I was just very earnest and using poetry rather than any particular skill that I had, I think. Um, and I think I, I had some good timing. And as the classes became larger, I ended up moving over to another space on the east side rather than the west side, close to where I lived. And everything kind of unfolded from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like it was a little bit of the divine timing of just being in that place at the right time and just here's the teacher training. Why not? (laughs) For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, And you mentioned 
in the beginning, there was some nervousness, of course, anytime we do something that's unfamiliar. Could you speak a little to just finding your voice um, over the years? What that has I, will, like? I will as soon as the sirens are done. <laughs> yeah. So right on the Upper East Side, so there's a lot of action. All right. Speaking to the nervousness was your question? And finding your voice finding over the years, yeah, as a teacher, mm -hmm. what that journey has been like. Right. Well, I think a lot of it is trial and error. At the beginning, I didn't want to talk about matters of the spirit at all, and I would just teach the physical forms, and then I would read a poem at the end. Maybe I would read a poem at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And slowly I started to see that I myself was a pretty good poet, so I started writing some poetry. I never read it in class. But as I wrote poetry, I started to realize that I could actually speak about things in a slightly different way. Shortly after I began teaching, I met the founder of what was then Anasura Yoga, John Friend. Mm -hmm. That has since crumbled, of course, as most of you know. But if you don't know, he was a really, at his time, a really fine teacher of alignment and gave us a lot of principles that still hold true today in the body. He also, in his training, helped us to see the value of creating what's called a theme, as most of us know, for our classes. And in creating this theme, we learned how to weave an emotional state or calling into the physical form which I feel was a very, at the time, very challenging, uh, very confronting, and ultimately, in the long run, very helpful for the development of my voice as a teacher because it's helped me to refine and edit myself vocally in a way that really helps my students have an experience that they're coming for, which is an experience of themselves they're not coming for an experience of me. They're coming to have an experience of themselves. And so that early learning of how to really be concise and really weave a theme into a physical practice in a way that would solidify and actually magnify the emotional qualities was very useful to me. Mm. Yes, I, th I found my first Anisara classes in, I think it was 2011. And I remember just feeling after leaving my first class, like there, this is so much deeper. It was like, got to my bones of just like, this is some, there's something here for me. And I actually did training in the Anisara tradition. But that piece about weaving in our spiritual themes and being able as I found my voice as a teacher, getting to um, take experiences from my life that I was learning and weave that into a class brought it that much more depth that I think sometimes is lost in, in the teachings of yoga. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask you, Elena, about becoming a mother and how that has played a role in your spiritual practice, in your, in your life, in your progression, this is spiritual, spirituality. Well, it makes a big difference in how I show up every day because I feel like it matters differently now. Mm. There's somebody who's kind of observing even when he's not around me and close to me and with his, when he's with his dad. Um, we're not together, but we're very close. And um, I'm much more inclined to behave well now that I have a kid. <clears throat> and especially now he's almost 11 and um, he's becoming a beautiful young man, very caring, loving, conscious, sensitive, uh, capable young man. And... I feel a lot of it is that the four of us, myself, my partner, his dad, and his partner, are all very conscientious, very connected to source, as each of us sees it. And uh, he gets to have an experience of that all the time. 
you know, caring humans who are um, in their spirituality in their own ways and not forcing it on him at all, mm. but in fact just enjoying their lives and, you know, behaving themselves in a way that is of use to the rest of the world, and, and he gets to see that. Mm-hmm. That sounds like he calls you into a, a higher self a version of yourself who um, that you want to be perceived as or that you want to, sh- to be there for him as. I know that something that you speak to in your work is the journey of becoming sober. And this is something that has been present um, for me. Someone very close to me has uh, let go of marijuana. And I think a lot of, um, I live in California and a lot of people here don't really even seem to think marijuana is something that you know, we could get addicted to or it could affect our lives in such a profound way. Um, and I've been able to witness just some of the changes and power that this person is taking back in his life in making that decision. And I wonder if you could speak to your journey of sobriety. It happened almost three years ago it was the end of a long year of not really putting myself first and putting the sort of idea that I had about what I was doing prioritizing the quote-unquote relaxation of it and the fun of it when really it was stealing my time away from my business and from my family in a way that was very deleterious. And when I finally prioritized myself and took it on and decided that that was the end of that road, that indeed I was an addict, indeed I was a slave to it. You know, I I really could not imagine a day without it. Um, I was about 40 days as they say, it's really true. About 40 days in, I was free. And I knew that I was never going to have a problem again. Mm. And since then, it's been actually really easy, fun, pleasant. I have, let's see, grown my savings and my investments by almost tenfold. Mm. Their years, I have grown a team of about 5,400 women and men at the last check this morning. I have a family that believes in me and that trusts me and that counts on me for various things that they couldn't really count on before. They could kind of, but not really. Um, And I have a lot of sober friends, (laughs) which I didn't have before. (laughs) I didn't have to change too many friends. Just a few dropped off, but I didn't have to change too many friends because most of my friends decided they were on the board with me. Yeah. And uh, it was so lovely. Truly, it's been the loveliest thing. And this is actually the week of Burning Man when I would normally go and just let it all, all go. And I haven't been back since I got sober, but next year I plan on going if all goes according to my plan. You know, and not not partaking in anything whatsoever, just enjoying the art, which a lot of folks do, thousands of folks do. For me, uh, that's a big step, you know, and it's a beautiful feeling to take a stand for myself and make a change in my life that has been just extraordinarily positive Mm. and uh, very exquisite for me. I'm curious what the moment of making that decision, that final decision of like, I'm done. How did that come about? Uh, It wasn't one moment. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of things that were said and shared that led me to that. And the day that I did, I just was done. There was nothing left and I wasn't going to get anything more. And I was just going to give it a go for a little while based on something that, uh, based on the fact that I really just needed to know who I was, I, I, I <clears throat> couldn't hold it together. You know, I was just eking by. I was doing great work. Everything was perfectly fine, but it wasn't fantastic. 
mm-hmm. and I couldn't save any money. And, mm-hmm. you know, it may offend some people that that was one of the big um, catalysts, but between my best friend Gabby Bernstein telling me that I can't serve God when I'm getting high every day to realizing that I also couldn't save money if I was getting high every day because I couldn't really sink my teeth into anything fully enough to earn Mm -hmm. an adult living. Those were the two main sort of catalysts. And now that I have money, I understand how absolutely perfect it is to be financially independent as a woman. Yes. And how important it is to be that example for many, many thousands, if not millions of other women. Yes. So I'm okay with that. (laughs) Well, something I feel like it has to do with a containment. And it's like you were drawing your energy back in and containing it. And I think that relates to just when we have these like leakages or drains um, in our lives, it's hard to really hold that energy. It's very true. Yeah. So if there is anyone out there listening to this and on that path of becoming sober and wanting that, what pulled you through? What really helped you? So it wasn't hard for me. Every day, every morning I woke up and I made a piece of art and I shared it on Instagram. It was the very beginning of Instagram, like when it, before Instagram was really what it is today, three years later. And... I made a little piece of art or I wrote something and I shared it there. I didn't tell anyone I was getting sober. I just shared uh, my path through Gabby's book, which was May Cause Miracles at the time, 40 days of practices, really miracle mindset. And that's all I did. I had a purpose during the time that I usually smoked and, you know, looked at the sky and kind of lost myself for a couple of hours, I made a piece of art, and then I got to work for those couple of hours. And I started to build my team, Mm. my essential oils team. Mm. And now, between then and now, I'm already Blue Diamond, which is a very high rank with doTERRA, and a very comfortable, um, fulfilling understanding that I have, both financially and... um, let's say emotionally, that I'm helping so many women, as I said, a few men, but mostly women, and I'm helping them to come to the same understanding that they can, in fact, A, let go of your addiction, you don't need it, B, be wealthy, you can, you should, it's a really good idea, it's great for everyone, it's great for you to let the money in, let the money out, it's totally the smartest thing that we can do for our families, Um, be generous with it, you know, put it where it's needed, donate your, donate away, save away. Mm. It's just nothing but a great idea. Mm. Yeah. I was talking with someone recently, a, a conversation about money and that saving and giving were like two ways of telling your body and your mind, I have enough. And actually that state of I have enough actually attracts more to you. That's nice. That's a really beautiful um, understanding. And if you can sort of call together all the people that you've ever spoken to who, who talked in some way about this and make that into an episode, a best of episode on saving and giving, I am enough, whatever I have enough, whatever you want to call it, it would be a really nice reminder for people. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for that idea. Where do you feel like you are focusing most of your energy right now? My team. Mm. In, in the doTERRA or beyond that? <clears throat> doTERRA. I, even, I have a book launching in a couple of weeks, and that does take up some of my um, time and, you know, who, who shall I send it to and et cetera. But they're, um, my team is just the best. I love my leaders. I love their leaders. It's so so much fun to to love them and watch them rise. Yeah, and you're getting to be this teacher in a new way and a leader yes. in a new way. Still teaching, still leading. Tell me about the essential oils and just how they have impacted your life. Well, the efficacy was first. I'm a scientist. 
by nature. I've used essential oils for 20 years and just love them. But <clears throat> my, my real fun with the oils was the fact that they work. You know, lavender really does work on my headache. Breathe really does work on my allergies. Digest and really does work when I'm not well in my belly, which used to happen a lot more before I got my gut floor organized. Frankincense and geranium really do work on my skin in my, in my face oil, mm -hmm. face oil. There's just no question. And so to be presented with an opportunity to share the oils create an organization and a business of my own, earn an incredible living. I could literally stop teaching yoga right now and never go back. But now I can do it because I love it. I don't have to do it for the money. Mm. To be able to do all of that has been such a blessing. I can't even begin. And to know that, you know, one of the major points about self-care is the closeness to nature. How can I get into nature every day? And now I live, have to live close to Central Park now, but, <clears throat> pardon, to have the oils constantly in my life. I have always two or three diffusers running in my home in every room. I have oils near the kitchen sink, oils in the bathroom, oils near my desk, oils right here on my, on my um, video desk, you know, my, my interview space in my house. They're everywhere, and they're constantly uplifting and providing nourishment to me. Mm -hmm. And they're a major part of my self-care ritual. So to me, it's a, it's a no-brainer. And I'm constantly amazed and surprised at how satisfying the business has turned out to be. Mm -hmm. What would you say is a morning or evening ritual you do with the oils? What are some of your <clears throat> practices? I'll just talk about today. I found myself on my cycle as of this morning. So the first thing I did was grab the Clary Calm, which is a roller ball, and put it all over my belly. Excellent for balancing hormones. The base of it is Clary Sage. Next thing, go into the bathroom, immediately splash wild orange into the bathtub before I start the shower running. So the minute the shower goes on, wild orange in the air. So nice. Anything will do, but I had wild orange handy. Grapefruit is great for that. <clears throat> Even lime is really fun, very enlivening. Um, I have a new blend coming out with doTERRA soon. The new blend is called Arise, and it's awesome. And that one goes really well in the shower, too. For my face, uh, I usually wash my face with some very simple cleanser from Alkytus or doTERRA. And then I put frankincense and geranium into the gel that I put on my face. Mm. I have my own homemade deodorant that I make, which is a combination of peppermint, geranium, lavender, and eucalyptus in equal parts. Neat, meaning direct, not diluted, right under my arms, keeps all the bacteria away, keeps me smelling incredible. <clears throat> For my scent, I usually wear In Tune, which is a roller ball. Um, I, during the summer, I always hide it. I'll put it under my hair on the insides of my wrists because it does have a little bit of a citrus, which can cause photosensitivity. So I'm very careful about that. Uh, deep blue on my lower back because today was that day, of course, first day of my cycle. So I put deep blue roller on my lower back. Can you see? It's everywhere in my house. The soap, <laughs> the hand soap. The house cleaner concentrate in my kitchen when I clean off the counters, the detergent for the laundry that I did this morning, all doTERRA, the toothpaste, doTERRA, yeah. the diffusers before I come and sit and practice and meditate, doTERRA. So it's lovely. It's, I, I can't tell you how much more time I take just taking care of myself now, and it doesn't feel indulgent at all. It feels like the best possible thing. I wake up my child. And I'm in the best mood. I wake up my lover. I'm in the best mood. Everything is just fine with these oils around. Yeah, they're powerful. I also use doTERRA. It's, it really is a powerful way to just enhance, you know, your mood or to feel if there's almost like a, a decadence to it of just using the oils, feeling like, wow, this is such a nurturing thing to do for myself. It's a memory that we're having. Mm. It's a memory because in, in ancient civilizations, oils were used all the time. 
Mm-hmm. It's, it's not it's not some you know esoteric thing that I'm saying to you. It's I feel honestly and earnestly that it's a cellular memory that we're having from past generations going way back in time. Yes. I feel like a lot of women are waking up to that right now of just seeing, you know, feeling of what could have been in past lives, you know, priestesses, all of these different traditions that are coming forth, women rising in their feminine, coming into their voices. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on just what you see happening right now in the collective consciousness, what's happening with women, what's happening in the feminine and coming back into greater balance. The way that I see it, most of the men that I know are starting to realize that they actually need to get a little softer and uh, start listening. I don't just mean listening with their ears. I mean listening in the aggregate, in the bigger sense, the more um, divine sense. I think that most people are starting to realize that their integrity matters. And if they're in integrity, timing will be on their side. I think most people are starting to realize that the more esoteric conversations are not frivolous nor decadent, that they're actually really a necessary part of having a functional life. And I think that the more I look around, as dire as the situation does seem, particularly in the States with the president and the very fascinating choices and misunderstandings that he is highlighting in his uh, time in office thus far, I'm also feeling a lot of consciousness and a lot of activism in my community. Tonight I'm cooking dinner for Kerry Kelly, who's going to do a protest in front of Trump Tower regarding the 800,000 children that are about to be deported from this country. Children. I'm surrounded by people who are taking action, giving, donating, empowering, sharing, believing. So that's what I choose to focus on. Mm -hmm. It's like standing for what you believe in and holding that space, taking action in that, supporting people doing that. Tell us about Practice You, the journal that is coming out. So Practice You is a... <clears throat> a really beautiful journal that I created myself. My publisher wouldn't do it unless I did all the artwork myself. <laughs> so there was a bit of a delay as I wrapped my mind around the fact that I was going to be painting again. But it happened all last summer. It was a few uh, a few months after my mom passed away. And one morning after I'd had this conversation with my publisher and was feeling a lot of resistance to it, I figured out that my mom would be thrilled if I started painting again. And so five to seven every morning last summer, I was painting watercolors. Mm. They all came together in a nine chapter, stunning journal full of prompts to help you create a map to your highest self. Each chapter has a, a few prompts at the beginning a letter that you'll write to yourself at the end at a very certain age in your life, whether it's previously, present, or future. And many prompts within the chapter to help you to see the profundity and the beauty and the light that is constantly raining down upon you. And I'm very proud of this project because it really is about my mom. It really is for her. And it really is a way that I healed from you know, losing her and the, the guilt and the pain of that, which was big, was truly mitigated by this project. Mm. I felt very connected to her the whole time I was sitting by myself and painting because I know that's what she would always love when she would open my door and find me in there creating something in my room as a kid. So mm. it happened quite organically and now it's, um, it's out. It's out right now pre-ordering, and then full blast on September 19th of 2017 this year. It's beautiful that you transformed something that was of grief and pain into your creativity and your art. Yeah. Super nice. 
Do you have any other um, just maybe tips or thoughts for anyone out there who may be experiencing grief or pain? Um, how to work through that? You know, there's a sutra. I don't usually do this, but it comes straight to my mind. One Chapter 1, Sutra 36. And it is... The it's this it's something about the state of consciousness that is free from sorrow and anguish, infused with light. Hold on, I'm going into the file. Anchors the mind to the to the flow that is free of all thought. So imagining the paradox of being anchored to a flow first of all Mm. that is free from all thought it's infusing our state of consciousness with so much light that we can only anchor to the way in which we're letting things in and letting them out as quickly as we let them in so nothing can take up residence for too long in here and nothing can you know make a huge dent on my mood it's a state of mind that is free from sorrow and anguish, infused with inner light, anchoring to that steadiness, stiti, free from thought. Mm. Steady flow. Yeah. I think that's it. I really should check, but I'm pretty sure that that's it. I really, Lord knows I've read it enough times and I've thought about it enough times. Um, infused with light. I know that that's part of it. Beautiful. If you're if you're going through grief and sorrow, this is what I did anyway. I put I put the most beautiful picture of my of my mom as a child up in my workspace, and I just loved her up from the second she left. I just loved her the whole time that she was leaving, the whole day that she was departing. I loved her. I sang to her Om Doom Durge Namo Namaha. Sang the whole day. I prayed to her. I read her beautiful poems. You know, my family was there. And then ever since then, I just keep her very close. And I am constantly, she's constantly here. Infusing myself with that light is how to stay free. And I definitely still cry. I definitely, every now and again, I get in bed with my kid and he's going to sleep. And he'll like put his hand on me in a certain way. I know that it's my mom there. And tears will start falling off of my face. And he'll be like, oh... Mimi's here. Mimi's what she was called. Mimi's here, isn't she? And I just wordlessly, you know, nodding my head yes. And having this profound experience is a great way to be free from sorrow and anguish. Yeah. Yeah. Having the reverence of just the beauty of life. And yes, there is pain, but even that can be beautiful. Yes. Mm. I really should look up that sutra. Thank you for sharing it. <laughs> I, I'm praying that I have it right. I, I work from the Secrets of the Yoga Sutra by Pandaji uh, Rajmani Tiganayat of the Himalayan Institute. Um, I'm pretty sure I have it, but let us pray. Yeah. Yeah. Inshallah, which is, you know. Like Inshallah. <laughs> My favorite expression. I have a few best, best, best friends in Turkey. And so we say that a lot, inshallah. Beautiful. Well, I'd love to hear just what's coming up in your business, your offerings. You have the book coming out. Anything else that you want to share with people listening, how they can connect with you, um, anything that they might be interested in looking into? Well, the book is one, practiceyou.com. You will so love it. And I guarantee If you're listening to this podcast, you will want to buy at least two copies because you're going to want to gift it. It's not expensive. It's under $20 and um, it's, it's going to be the best gift for the holidays. I have a feeling the second thing would be the oils that are coming out. The three new blends really excited by the time this podcast airs, they will be out in full force. Um, It's called the Yoga Collection from doTERRA. And I helped to formulate them. And I'm very proud of the work that we did together as a team. And 
The third thing would be to go directly to Yoga Glow, Y-O-G-A-G-L-O, and enjoy not just over 150 classes of mine, but programs with me where I'll take you through self-care for women is the title of one of them. And I'll take you through 12 classes over four weeks is my intention, but you can take them as long as you like. Um, teaching yourself how to really greet yourself with respect and take care of yourself as an example to all the folks around you. Another one is coming soon that I won't ruin the surprise, but it does have to do with recovery mm. program on yoga glow. And I would also say, you know, just to keep in mind that the important hours of your own self study and self care really are the early morning hours. And for some reason, I think somebody who's going to listen to this needs to hear this, but I'm going to say this too, which is just get rid of the television. I swear you don't need it. I swear you can watch the few things you need to watch on your laptop. And without a television, sucking all of the energy out of your home, you will have a completely different life of listening and even productivity and caring about each other and your family in a totally different way. Mm -hmm. And the, referencing the early morning, because I interrupted myself, the early morning is when the moon is at about 60 degrees, sometimes between 4 and 7 a.m., let's say, if you can manage it, which I recommend. And it's the time to wake up and just sit and pray, listen, practice if you're so inclined, breathe if you can, and lengthen the, the, the breaths that you're taking so that you can really be present for yourself. That's the greatest gift that I can give to somebody is to remind them of that time of the day and how, how important it is for the rest of the day and how the rest of the day unfolds. Yes. And that really starts with the evening before. So <laughs> I, I uh, used to work with um, clients as a health coach. And I remember just talking about waking up first thing in the morning and it's like, okay, well, let's, let's, turn off all the technology with the sunset and let's mm -hmm. you know have that space of really preparing yourself in the evening to go to bed early yes yeah it's the most important thing and i don't i don't even turn it off with the sunset I, maybe i turn it off around eight eight or nine let's say it's mm -hmm. perfect mm -hmm. you know you're in bed by 10 10 30 it's so lovely Waking up at a time early is a breeze. I don't even set an alarm anymore. I know my eyes are going to wake up sometime between five and six. Beautiful. Yeah. That was probably a huge shift for me once I started practicing yoga of just being able to start waking up earlier. And that was, well, from my yoga teacher training, we had to wake up at 5.30 in the morning. And the first two weeks of that, I just had to push through it because it wasn't easy. But yeah. after that, it became such a joy. And I love that reminder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been an honor to just get to sit with you and hear from you. Um, I Before I close this call and this time together, do you have any closing words, anything else you'd like to share and I'll close with a short prayer one of my uh, dear teachers I have I have really three sort of lineages that I follow one is Hara Yoga and that's Swami Rama Panditji Rajmani Tiganaya to Yoga Rupa Rod Striker who um, is probably my main influence at this moment he talks a lot in his work about the part of us that's always at rest. And I am constantly returning to this in my own mind and in my own prayers. And I think that that's an important way to close, to just keep in contact with that part of you that's always listening and always quiet, no matter what the condition of your body, your age, your belief system, your religion there is a part of you that is always at rest. And if you can keep that part of you close, uh, a lot of goodness will come from that understanding and that effort. Beautiful. Thank you. 
Let's just take a moment to breathe that in. Tuning into that part of you that is always at rest. It's still silent space. Vast space holding ourselves with unconditional love. I'm going to just bring my hands together, my heart, and just imagining that beautiful visual you gave to us earlier of just being connected to source and having that flow, being in that flow, moving through, allowing the things that are challenging to pass through us, holding ourselves with love and with integrity. I'll just bow with gratitude. Thank you. Thank you to everyone listening. and Thank you to Elena. Namaste. Namaste. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to our show today. We would love to hear what you think. Take a moment to hop on over to iTunes and leave us a review. We'd be so grateful to receive it. Until next time, namaste. Namaste.